Okay, so going to be talking to all of you today a little bit about forecasting at the trade desk. Um, yeah, probably might not be what you're expecting, so uh, bear with us. Um, we came up with a rather snazzy title for this, yeah, from trillions of potential avails uh, down to just a few metrics. Uh, so basically, we're just going to talk through that process of how we go from the very top of our funnel all the way down to some business metrics that we could actually use. So, introduce myself briefly. Hi, I'm, I'm Ed Norton. Uh, yes, I used to be far more young, fresh-faced and attractive. Um, and I've been here for about a year, um, but I've been doing this stuff for the best part of a decade now, so I, uh, I feel old. Um, also got my colleague John, who will be joining um, doing the second half of the presentation. He's been here a little longer than I have, um, but we've both spent most of our time on forecasting. So I'm hoping we're the right guys to talk to you about this, but maybe not. Hopefully, hopefully we are. Okay, agenda wise. So uh, first things first, we're going to be looking at forecasting at the trade desk. So this is a little bit around what forecasting is at the trade desk, but also what it isn't. Um, which will be quite important. And then basically what we're going to do is work through the funnel, uh, starting with potential impressions and then a series of scaling factors that we use to reduce that down to some tangible business metrics. Uh, after that, we'll have a little look at the forecasting tool because it'd be nice to actually see the product that we mostly work on. Um, and then finally, we'll talk a, bit, yeah, a little bit around how we measure this problem because it's a little bit of a... It's, a, it's an awkward problem to measure, but we'll get to that. Okay, so we're going to start off with the negative. So what it isn't. Uh, so typically when we talk about forecasting, right, uh, we have a nice well-defined time series and we're just projecting that forward. You know, we're using an ARIMA model, an LSTM, got to get the, got to get some buzzwords in there. I'm getting them in. Um, uh, or maybe we just slap it all into profit um, and just get it to do it for us. So at the trade desk, this isn't really the way we actually think about forecasting because just getting that time series is really difficult. So getting a single point on that time series is difficult. Trying to get all the, all the points we would need to actually project that forward uh, is, yeah, is uh, not impossible, but computationally difficult, let's say. Um, so typically what we think about is more looking backwards. And I guess if we're ever in a position which hopefully we will be in a few years, where actually projecting forwards is the thing we're looking at. I'd say we're in a pretty good place, so yeah. Now, what it is. So to us, uh, we have advertisers. <laughs> yeah, people know that image, don't they? Uh, you have to look carefully at it, but yeah. <laughs> um, so what it is to us, uh, we have advertisers, advertisers, clients, so we work with a bunch of companies that everyone knows. Uh, I don't know if we list them anywhere, but uh, a lot of big companies, they will come to us or we also have our internal traders and they want to know, given some targeting settings, so I want to target dog lovers in the US who have Android phones or something. Um, I know I'm going to give slightly different examples to the slides, really spices it up. Um, um, we can, and also maybe we don't want to show the same user an ad more than 10 times a day or something like that. Uh, what they want to know is how much money can I spend? There are some other metrics that we'll go into, but like fundamentally, I have a hundred thousand pounds of budget or dollars, probably it's all in dollars, American company. Um, how much can I spend given those settings and given some time period? I've got 14 days. I want to run this campaign. What kind of money can I spend? Do I need to adjust my settings? Maybe I can be a bit broader uh, because I'm not going to spend my budget. Maybe I can narrow it down. Maybe I can get to something a bit more detailed. So it's very much part of planning. So quickly talk through the inputs and the outputs. Um, so as we talked about, yeah, this is uh, trade desk clients uh, come in. They want to understand how much they can spend. And again, this is part of planning. So this is before typically they start a campaign. Although forecasting is used throughout the trade desk for other cases, this is the main case we talk about. Uh, we talked a little bit around the targeting settings and the campaign length. We also asked them to give us an indication of how much uh, their average CPM will be. So CPM, cost per mil, which means a thousand for some reason. Basically, how much am I expecting to pay? 
And the reason we ask for this is just to give us an indication of like how, how far they're prepared to go to win, basically. And so this helps inform our win rate models, which we'll talk about in a little bit. In terms of outputs, key metrics, we have potential spend. How much money could you, could you spend if you really wanted to? We have potential impressions slash ads, like how many times if you're, is your ad going to be seen? Uh, and then we've got reach, which is like how many distinct users. Uh, finally, in terms of requirements, because this is part of planning, there's an expectation that we can churn these forecasts out in a few seconds, um, ideally within a second, but certainly we can't be waiting a minute. Um, because if someone wants to know, oh, how much could I spend? They look at it, it's not the number they wanted. They need to broaden their settings. They need to be able to quickly iterate. So that kind of impacts how we solve the problem, which we'll go on to now. Okay, so top of our funnel. Uh, this, we start off with how many, we've got this kind of arbitrary eco space of all the ads. And we want to work out how many ads they could potentially bid on. Um, so this basically is a function of their targeting settings. Now, because of the huge uh, number of potential permutations, you can imagine, you know, it's not just dog lovers and cat lovers. I believe there are other examples of things you can target. Um, but basically, you can imagine all the different countries, states, zip codes, and that's just geography. We've got about 100 different types of things you can target, and each of those has cardinalities of anywhere from 10 to a million. Um, and if you times those all together, you get some fairly large numbers. So being, we can't pre-cache all the different permutations. And it's also, it wouldn't even reduce our data set if we just grouped by all of those dimensions. Basically, you'd be lucky if you see a few uh, ads that actually match the same uh, kind of dimension space, if you will. So in order to overcome this, we rely on data sketches. So data sketches are some compact representation of your space, uh, typically working with arbitrary sets. So ones you might be familiar with, like Bloom filters, Minhash, Hyperlog log, they all have different use cases. But for what we're trying to do, we look for the use case of distinct counts. So basically, what we can do is we can create a, this arbitrary representation for cat lovers, but also for people in the US and, I don't know, come up with a better example. Um, uh, people from California, I'm running out. I'm running out. There's definitely more. Uh, I, will, I will note the trade desk have a lot of different things you can do. The weather, that's another one. Um, but basically what we can then do is with these arbitrary representations, we're able to do intersections and unions and get approximations for these distinct counts. So it basically kind of handles, instead of having to store every single permutation, we only have to store a single representation for some small segment that we can then combine to the client's requirements. Cool, so we now magically end up with a number for potential uh, impressions. Um, after that, we need to start scaling that down because at the end of the day, it's all very well and good saying, you know, there's a billion things you could possibly bid on, but we already know you're not going to win them all. So then we start layering on win rates. Now we have a, we have a few win rate models uh, across the trade desk. Some are at the impression level, and this is more we're thinking of uh, in like real-time bidding, we might want to adjust your bid price to hit a certain win rate. Uh, but for forecasting, we're thinking on a much more kind of broad scale. So we're thinking uh, for this kind of general kind of space of ads, given some pricing strategy, what would your win rate be? Now, it's a lightning talk, and I'm sure I'm already a bit over time. So I won't go too much into the actual model, but after the talk um, and after the panel, if you guys want to ask me a bit more about it, I'm happy to do a little bit of detail. But basically, we are able to predict some win rate, and then we can then layer that on top of what we already have to start reducing the number of impressions that you end up with. Now, I'm going to be handing over to John, who will take you through some of the rest of the funnel and then a little bit beyond that. Thanks, Ed. Okay, so now we have an estimate of how many potential impressions a campaign with these targeting settings could win. And the next thing we want to know is how many out of those impressions, how many distinct users could we reach? We also want to scale down those impressions for our frequency caps. And when I say frequency cap, I mean that 
the client might tell us in their targeting settings that they want to restrict how many times the same users could see ads from this campaign. For example, they might set a maximum of 10 ads per user per hour or something like that. So to estimate reach, we firstly predict the frequency distribution of a campaign with these targeting settings. Uh, <laughs> when I say frequency distribution, I mean uh, how many distinct users see each X frequency of ads. And once we have our frequency distribution, we take its average, we divide the predicted impressions by the average frequency, and that gives us the reach. Now, the reason we predict the full frequency distribution is so that we can scale it down for the frequency caps, and we do that using Monte Carlo simulations. OK, so how do we predict our frequency distribution? So the, we can store the individual frequency distribution of each targeting setting. For example, we could store the frequency distribution of USA or iPhone, but we can't store the frequency distribution of every combination. There's just too many. So we predict it using a machine learning model. And we use a transformer that takes in any number of targeting settings and outputs the combined frequency distribution. Now, let's have a look at our forecasting UI. Uh, at the bottom here, we've got the, the client's targeting settings. In, and in this example, they're targeting people in London on mobile devices, and they set a frequency cap of no more than one ad per hour to the same user. And they've set an average bid price of $3 per 1,000 impressions. And like we've spoken about already, we have worked our way down the funnel. We've started by predicting the number of potential bids, which we don't show directly to the user here. But once we've applied our win rate, you can see the, the number of potential impressions here is between 460 million to 480 million. And then we multiply those impressions by our average bid price to get the potential spend, uh, which is around $1.4 million. We also have a forecasted frequency of 22 ads per user uh, and a predicted reach of 22 million users. So let's talk a little bit about measurement. Uh, and this is one of the things that makes our forecast very difficult is that it's hard to know what the truth should be for our forecasts. Uh, and one metric that we can compare against is our bidding system gives an approximation for potential spend. Uh, and this potential spend number is an attempt to project the actual spend for campaigns to adjust for their budget constraints. Uh, and that's because in our forecast, we pretend that the campaign has unlimited budget. But in reality, real campaigns have a, a limited budget. Uh, and some issues with using this as a, our truth set is, firstly, it's biased towards real historical campaigns. So our forecasting tool allows you to enter any arbitrary combination of targeting settings, but we're limited to validating against real campaigns that have actually run. Uh, next, the, the, this truth set itself is a projection. So potential spend is directionally accurate, but it's not the truth. So how do we use it? We select a set of stable campaigns. And when I say stable, I mean that their targeting settings haven't changed throughout the forecast duration. So typically, a, a real forecasting campaign would change their targeting settings quite a lot. So they might, for example, start out by targeting just Los Angeles and then realize that actually their budget allows them to target all of California. Uh, OK, so now we have a pretty limited set of campaigns that we can compare against. But we run our forecast against those. And that gives us an, an indication of end-to-end uh, -end accuracy. OK, so our measurement suite is made up of sandbox testing. Uh, we execute every forecast request twice. Firstly, against production, which is our existing system, and those forecasts are shown to our users. And then we also hit the sandbox environment, which has our test component. 
Uh, and those forecasts are executed and logged in our database, but they're not shown to any users. Uh, and once we have a set of both of those, we have some example uh, experiment results here. Uh, and we compare both uh, sandbox and production against uh, a list of metrics. So each box here is a different metric. And as we move to the left, this shows uh, a reduction in error from uh, control to the test environment. And the, the width of these bars is the confidence interval. Uh, and if our desired metrics are green, we would move our test component into production. We've improved our forecasts and we've made our clients very happy. Uh, and now Ed is uh, gonna, oh, there we, oh. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so we realized that there weren't really enough buzzwords in this talk, and I'm more than aware that there's some chatbots that will probably uh, kind of read this afterwards. There'll probably be some closed captions. So I thought we were just going to throw out a few just to make sure we tick some boxes. So um, AI. LLMs. Uh, LSTMs. Ad tech. Uh, oh, uh, big data. Spark. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. I think we've ticked some boxes there. Uh -oh. I was talking myself. <laughs>